Good morning and welcome back to Mornings in Matthew, our daily Bible study series through the book of Matthew. We are in chapter 21 of Matthew today, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and this marking the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life leading up to the cross. We have a lot to cover today in this chapter, so I really am going to dive straight in and I'm going to start here in verse 1. So let's start reading. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them uh, went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So we see Jesus here entering in Jerusalem on, on a donkey. And what's important to note, some of the context is the Jews are preparing here to celebrate Passover, one of, one of the annual feasts in Jerusalem that uh, the, the all Jews all around would have pilgrimage towards Jerusalem for this. Jesus is very clearly showing his messiahship. He is now publicly um, demonstrating this. It's not hidden anymore. He's not healing people and telling them not to say anything. He's making it clear. People are worshipping him. People are praising him. This is where we get the phrase of Palm Sunday. They're laying these palm trees down in the road. It's an incredible buzz. Lots of energy. Lots of excitement is stirring around. But we'll see what starts to develop and Things start to accelerate. In verse 12, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. When the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying they said to him? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. I've already mentioned that this is the um, festival of Passover. People coming in, making sacrifices at the temple. So what's going on with the money changes? There's animals. Some really important things that we need to understand. Because there are Jews pilgriming um, coming from all over to this place, they're bringing all kinds of foreign coins. And they would have often brought their own animals for sacrifice. But, but what needed to happen, a few things needed to happen. First, you needed to exchange your money into local currency. Um, you couldn't bring money into the temple that would have um, any kind of pagan symbols or idol, um, idols on it. Um, so you would have to change the local currency that was approved. You would also have to bring a sacrifice that was approved by the priests. And if the priest defer, declined your sacrifice, you would have to go and find another one. Often buying ones locally with inflated prices. And it was quite a corrupt system because often it was the priests who had raised animals and they were also selling animals, but they were also the ones declining your potential sacrifice. The system had become very insular and very corrupt. There were money changers making money off of these travelers. And again, they were paying exorbitant prices. 
really, um, what's the word, taking an opportunity from, taking advantage of these people. Um, it had become a very corrupt system. On top of this, the place they're doing it is in the outer courts of the temple, known as the, like the Gentile courts. The Gentiles couldn't enter the main temple, but they could come there as a place of prayer and a place to worship God. So in these Gentile courts, which was supposed to be a place of prayer, they're exchanging money and exchanging cattle. And these people, these priests are, a, they are using the people, they're making money off of them. It's, it's it, like I've said already, this has all become highly corrupt and deeply upsets and offends Jesus. We see his reaction. He turns over the tables. He drives them out. In other gospels, we hear that he, he makes a whip out of cords and drives them out of the area. They're indignant. They react to him. They're in the praise of the children. They're like, how can you allow them to be saying this about you? Um, obviously, they don't know, they don't believe in who Jesus is at this point. Um, but he responds with another Old Testament quote. And even through this chapter, there's going to be lots of Old Testament quotes. And if you want to do some deep study, look at the references. They're all in, your, in the footnotes of your Bible. Um, find those references. Look at those, those scriptures in their own context because it brings all of this even more to light. But for now, we'll keep on moving. In verse 18, early in the morning, as he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never be bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. We're seeing that same phrase again, this faith in prayer, this uh, mountains being moved. But we're seeing in the context of Jesus cursing a fig tree. Is he just upset? Is he just kind of throwing a rant? Absolutely not. Everything Jesus does has purpose and has meaning. This is nothing other than condemnation and judgment against these stubborn and rebellious people. Now, we could read this this cursing of the fig tree as being kind of cursing the uh, whole of Israel and their fruitlessness. I don't think, given the context of the rest of this passage, that's specifically what it's talking about. I think the context here leads us to believe that this condemnation is primarily to the religious leaders at the time. Not that it doesn't apply to us in the sense that we should be bearing fruit in our lives and there is an expectation of that before God. But I think as you'll see as we go on as well, this is a continual condemnation towards the religious establishment. The religious leaders who are supposed to be the good shepherds, but were failing in that task. In verse 23, Jesus entered the temple courts and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it amongst themselves and said, well, if we say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And then he said, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. They're coming, and again, they're kind of they're trying to trap Jesus, trying to test him, asking, Chris, well, where do you get this authority? How, how, how dare you come in here and tell us what to do? Jesus doesn't answer them directly, but he asks them a question, and they go away and they deliberate over how, how should they answer this question, and they're found in a conundrum, because if we say, yeah, John's baptism was from heaven, well, why didn't you obey John then? Why didn't you repent and do what he told you to do? But if we say it was just from men, well, the people believe he's a prophet, so they're going to rebel. We see the reasoning here. They're not honest truth seekers. They don't really want to know where Jesus' authority comes from. They don't, they're not really earnest and eager and sincere. They're just triggered and they, they don't like that he's coming in and challenging their way of doing things. So they're kind of pushing back. If they were sincere, 
they would have held a true belief. And if John's baptism really was from heaven, then they really would have repented. But if they really didn't believe that John was a righteous prophet, then they would have held to that belief and they would have had that held that with boldness and defended that. But they just cared about what the people think. They were fearful, they were afraid. You can see the deceit. You can see the ugliness in the inner life. It's starting to be revealed. Well, it's been revealed all along, but we're seeing that more clearly. And again, I want to reference back to a video we did, uh, the Matthew 20 video, where Jesus taught us about true leadership, suffering, serving, putting others before our own. We're seeing the complete opposite in the religious leaders at the time, these chief priests, um, these Sadducees, these elders. Let's carry on reading because Jesus continues to elaborate on this in these next two parables. In verse 28, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? Well, the first they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. See, again, Jesus continues the challenge, telling this story of two sons. One son said he'd do it, but didn't. Another said he wouldn't at first, but in the end did. Has clear parallels here to the Jews, to the Gentiles. The Gentiles, these tax collectors, these prostitutes, these sinners, at first have rejected and rebelled, but eventually they repented. They turned back to God, and in his grace they've been forgiven. But now these, these religious elites, the, the super spiritual ones, the ones that should have been entering first, that should have got it. And they are saying they were doing right. They, they, they're putting on the pretense. They're putting on the show, these hypocrites, these actors, but they're not repenting. They're not turning round back to God, turning away from their sin. They're continuing in their stubbornness, in their hard heartedness. Jesus is bringing judgment to them. He is condemning them. And we're going to see that turn up even more in the next few chapters. This final week of Jesus' life really begins to accelerate and he really begins to confront this religious establishment. Look here in verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time. And the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? I want to notice this next bit here. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at a harvest time. Pause there for a second. Jesus asks a question. Again, they answer in response. And they're kind of indignant here, you know? He'll bring those wretches to a wretched end. He'll give the he'll rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him a share of the crop at harvest time. I don't think at this point they're fully catching on to what Jesus is saying and who he's talking about. To us, we look back and it's quite a simple understanding and we get it now, but we have the context and we have the hindsight. And obviously, the son of the vineyard here is Jesus himself, who is going to be killed in only a matter of days. The prophets being the previous servants that have come. We know from the lots of the Old Testament, the religious leaders constantly killed and persecuted God's prophets who came to warn them and change their wicked ways, but they didn't listen. However, they're listening here I wonder what goes through their mind. I want to pose an option to you. What if in their mind, they're thinking of the Romans? See, the Romans were the ones currently, I guess, 
occupying this vineyard. They were the ones overseeing the, the Jews, enslaving them. Perhaps they got righteously indignant. Yeah, he's going to kick out and get rid of those Romans. Not fully grasping the parable at this point. I get kind of um, reminders of David and Nathan in 2 Samuel 12 when he is confronted and David doesn't pick up on the fact that the parable is applying to him. Uh, you should read that for yourself. It's a good story. Makes me think of this. But here in verse 42, Jesus said to them, have you never read in scripture that the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus's parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. See there, it sets in. They understand the meaning of the parable. Now they get it. The Pharisees, the chief priests, they understand now Jesus is talking about us. He quotes these Old Testament passages. Again, read them for your own reference. But he also quotes this, that we fall on the stone will be broken to pieces. If we come before God, Jesus being this capstone on which everything else is built, if we come to him with a broken and contrite heart, we'll be saved, we'll be forgiven. But if we don't, Eventually, that stone is going to fall on us and we will be crushed. It will be over for us. See, Jesus is going to be taking the kingdom, the, the God's people away from these corrupt leaders. He's going to be handing leadership over to his apostles, to his disciples, as we'll see in coming chapters, but especially in the rest of the New Testament. It's going to be taken from the hands of these unjust leaders who have begun to feed off of the people and use them for their benefit. Jesus is bringing judgment to them and their response, they're looking for a way to arrest him. The heat starts to turn up. They don't want anything to do with this Jesus. They want to get rid of him and they want to silence him. We'll see that escalation continue as we begin to finish off um, the Gospel of Matthew. But for us today, let's think of some application points that we can draw out from this. Well, a sin to avoid. Um, I think the corruption, I think of misuse and abuse. Sometimes when we think of abuse, we think of violence. But, you know, abuse can just really be misusing something. And here the, the religious leaders have become these lofty people overseeing, using the people for their own gain rather than serving others and lifting them up. They've begun feeding off of them. There was a sense of corruption. Now, we might think, oh, I'm not a leader. This isn't me. But how easily and how quickly can we take advantage of others who are in a position of suffering? Perhaps even in our faith, do we use Christianity? Perhaps we use Jesus as a way of trying to gain material wealth or gain blessing. We're not really here to follow Jesus with our whole hearts, really wanting to know God and love him. Perhaps we're just trying to use God and even use people in the process. A good heart check for us. Do I deeply, sincerely love God and love people? A promise to hold. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Verse 22. Now, this isn't some miraculous superpower, but we're talking about a relationship with God. When he is our father, when we're submitted to him, we can ask him for things. He will provide. He wants to bless us. We can have faith in our prayers. that He is listening. He is answering. He is providing. Um, An action, uh, no, sorry, an example to follow. I think Jesus, his incredible boldness here as he's confronting the religious leaders, especially his boldness as he drives people out of the temple. And why is he doing it? Well, he's defending God's honor and God's holiness, but he's also defending the oppressed, those in need, those who are suffering at this unjust and corrupt system. An action I'm called to, obedience. Not being the son who says I'll do it, but ultimately doesn't. We're called to obey, to follow through an action, to actually do what pleases God. If you're following all the way through with us, thank you so much for being here and for listening to this series. We've done about 23 videos today, uh, up to date. However, are we just listening and hearing, but not really applying? 
We've talked about five different applications points at every video. Have you applied what you're learning here in the text? Is your life changing? Are you being transformed internally? That's what God wants, hearts really changing before him and constantly turning to him. Finally, knowledge of God will link to that. He's looking for true worshippers, sincere worshippers. People are going to draw close to him in heart, in mind, in soul and in strength, in everything we have. Not just people coming and putting on a religious show, ticking some boxes, doing some spiritual things. That's not what God is looking for. And we see quite a clear condemnation of those who are highly religious, at least on the outside, but very corrupt on the inside. Let that not be true of us, but let's draw close to God in the way he calls us to. Let's close in prayer and uh, reflect a little bit on what we've covered. I know we've covered a lot in quite a short space of time. The beauty is you can always go back and review or dig deeper and do your own study. Um, I've talked about some of the Old Testament passages. One really interesting one would be Isaiah 5. It's where Jesus takes the this parable of the vineyard from, um, so parable of the tenants. So have a look into that for yourself and you'll see some of what Jesus is referencing and it might bring it more to light for you. But we'll pray right now and then we'll close. God, I just want to thank you so much um, for your word, um, for the clarity and the guidance we get in the scriptures. God, I just want to pray honestly that you um, can humble us and sober us. If in any way we resemble these um, religious hypocrites who on the outside look good, but on the inside it is dead and decaying. If in any way we're playing games or trying to give right answers or, or trying to appear spiritual and not be deeply transformed, just make that clear to us. So often we can be self-deceived. And if that's true of us, Lord, make it clear. Because ultimately we don't want to be like that. And we don't want to um, we don't want to receive this condemnation, this judgment. But we don't want to be displeasing to you, Lord. And we, and we know how repulsive you find this. And especially when we're taking advantage of other people, Lord or even trying to take advantage of you in different ways. Help us to be humble, help us to be spiritual, help us to be sincere, and help us to sincerely love you and love other people and to be like your son, Jesus. We love you and in his name we pray, amen. Once again, thanks so much for joining us. Please do leave some comments in the comments section, especially for today, anything I may have missed. We did move things through a bit quite quickly, so please share some other insights with us or any questions of things um, after this study or anything else you appreciated from today. Thank you so much for joining us. Tomorrow, we're gonna to be in Matthew 22, where we're gonna see the great commandment really come to life and see some other things too. So please join us then for now. Have a great day. See you tomorrow.